Uh, I mean, you can see my screen, right? Yes, I can see your screen. Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Mayank Bansal, um, working in a data infra group at Uber. And I'm presenting with my colleague, Bo Yang, who also work in the same group as me. And we, and we are here to present Zias, Uber's highly scalable and distributed shuffle as a service. Let's talk about um, uh, a bit about Uber. These numbers are a little old, so I don't have a current number. So um, user is a global. Oh, uh, so yeah, so the numbers would be a little bit different uh, currently. Uh, anyway, so Uber is a global company. Uh, we have completed 15 billion trips, approximately complete 18 uh, million trips per day. We have 16, we are, we are on six continents, 69 countries and 10,000 cities. And we have 103 million active monthly users who take rights every uh, month. And we have 5 million active drivers. Uh, let's talk about data and ML use cases at Uber. Um, Uber is a data-driven company and pretty much everything we do is data-driven. Data and ML is the backbone of all the processing happens at Uber. Here are some of the use cases I listed, such as Uber Eats, ETA, self-driving cars, etc. However, there are so many which I can't even list in this one slide. Um, so all these use cases are actually being supported uh, by data and ML at Uber. Let's talk about uh, some of the these use cases a little bit more. Um, Let's first talk about our ETAs, right? So ETA, uh, ETAs are the core to Uber experience. Whenever any use, user open their app and they see, um, um, open their app and they see the cars uh, available in five minute distance, that information is coming from ETA system. ETAs are used by many other systems in Uber, such as Eats. Uh, ETAs are generated by route-based algorithm and ML model predicts the route at the runtime. We also have a feedback loop to our models, which gets improved day by day based on the ETA error we get to the better user experience. ETAs are improved a lot, um, all thanks to data and ML use uh, at Uber. Let's talk about um, driver and rider match. Right. This is another big use case for Uber. Whenever um, user and user open their app and request a ride based on their location, Uber app, Uber app actually optimizes the rider and driver. All these optimizations are done by data and ML models at the runtime. We also predict if user will take a trip or not using our machine learning models. Let's talk about Eats. Right. Eats is a very big business for Uber. Um, pretty much everything which gets ren rendered on the Uber Eats app is through the hundreds of models in the background. We use machine learning models for ranking of restaurants, ranking of dishes, preferences, predictions, delivery times, and even search ranking on all the restaurants as well as for the dishes you order. Let's talk about another big use cases for Uber, which is uh, self-driving cars. As we all know that data and ML is a crucial piece of autonomous vehicles. Each and every prediction, run time decisions, maps, route, all is driven by ML and data. ML and data is uh, giving uh, is doing a lot of uh, 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 benefit for the autonomous vehicle for each and so this, the the picture you see on the uh, on the slide is pretty much what your car sees at the runtime and all these being rendered through mln data for the uber let's talk about the uber's data stacks how it looks like um 
we have a lot of events uh, which gets generated through app and otherwise, such as mobile app events, device, telemetry, microservices generated a lot of events. We also collect a lot of database events as well as third-party feeds. We collect them using Kafka, and then we ingest them into the in-memory database such as Pino, ArisDB, or the tiered offline storage such as HDFS. On top of it, we have Compute Fabric, which is consists of Yarn and Peloton. Yarn, everybody knows, is a Hadoop compute engine. We also have something in, called Peloton. Uh, Peloton is run on Mesos, and it's a over unified resource scheduler. Our data and ML workloads run on both the schedulers, Yarn as well as Peloton. Most uh, in our in our in our processing, Yarn is the most prominent one which we use. On top of it, we have stream processing uh, engines such as Flink, as well as we have batch processing engines such as Spark, Taze, MapReduce. On top of it, we have query engines such as AthenaX uh, for our real-time aggregation, aggregation queries. We have Presto and Vertica for ad hoc and interactive queries. And we have Hive for complex and the batch processing. On top of it, we have all these orchestration engines, such as Piper, uh, which is data preparation, or the orchestration workflow orchestration engine. We have different dashboards. We have different query, ad hoc query uh, editors, such as Query Builder, and then the BI tools, such as GSW and Tableau. Now, let's talk about uh, Uber's ML stock, uh, ML stack, which is Michelangelo. Uh, Michelangelo is a very uh, prominent tool which is being used and is very, is very popular um, also. So what a Michael, Michelangelo uh, to, uh, does is uh, we have, it, it, generates, uh, it generates all the events of the Kafka, and then it gets prepared uh, through stream processing, Flink, and the batch processing hive. Stream processing will put this information into uh, out out syncs like Kafka again or any other uh, Cassandra, and the batch processing high vintage will put them into the data uh, data lake like HDFS. And then in ML, we do like a lot of prototyping. We do this prototyping through uh, Jupyter notebooks or the Spark Magic. Um, after that, we use for the trainings which we use TensorFlow, PyTorch, Exibus, and SparkML. And for the interference, we for the real-time prediction services, we use uh, for the interference, as well as batch prediction jobs. We have different stores, such as feature stores, to store all the features. We have model stores for store all the models. And then we have also the metric stores, where we can slice and dice all the metrics together to come up with the models. Let's talk about a little bit um, Apache Spark at Uber. Um, Apache Spark um, is the primary analytics execution engine where uh, pretty much 90% of the processing happens through Spark, whether that is a normal Spark or high one Spark. We run on Spark on Yarn as well as on Peloton. For all the Spark we use, we use external shuffle service. Um, I'm talking about before the ZS, we used to use uh, external shuffle service. Um, let's talk about um, uh, the external shuffle service of, for a little bit of uh, context. We have mapper host, and I mean, as you see in this fi figure, we have uh, mappers and the reducers. They are mapper host and the reducer host. Uh, we have mapper host, uh, mapper task generates a lot of shuffle data, which gets stored into data files on the local machine through local shuffle service. Uh, there are different partitions being stored into those machines. And then there is index file, which actually goes and you know have this uh, index for each all these partitions. Similarly, you, you can see there is a host uh, which runs the other executors, which are running uh, ma reducer task. And then in the reducer task, there is something called shuffle reader, which will go and connect each and every mapper machines through shuffle um, through shuffle service um, uh, to the ma reducer host, sorry, the mapper host, and then uh, stream all the output, uh, mapper outputs, right? And then combine them, put them uh, business logic on top of it, and then store it into the, uh, uh, store it into the local machine, 
as well as um, maybe that storing part. Can people still be... hear or see? I cannot see Miak. Hey, uh, boy, I can hear you. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, so, uh, okay, sorry. Um, so yeah, so then reducer will go and stream output and then put the data into the local, uh, into the HDFS or any other storage. However, that could be a multi-step process where you, you may have to have different uh, spills which you need to combine, etc. So this is how the whole Spark uh, external shuffle service work, right? Uh, this is just for context. Uh, so there are certain limitations regarding this process, right? Uh, and the limitations are, the first limitation is, uh, uh, for the context, we use uh, compute and storage separately in our data centers. So uh, what it means is we use a base machines uh, for our uh, compute, right? And which is pretty much having one SSDs. Uh, so generally, there is a concept called DWPD in SSDs, which is you write um, how much data you write per day on the disk, right? So generally, it is one. Uh, so and then if you have a D DWPD as one, what it means is your disk, you can write and uh, delete one times a day um, for three years. So then it, this disk will uh, work for three years. However, at Uber, We've been using, as I said earlier, that we've been using Spark for the most of the our processing. We are producing so much shuffle data that each machine actually writes four to five times, which caused our SSDs to wear out very, very fast. Uh, hence, uh, the, uh, the the machines or the hardware which needs to be replaced after three years has to be has to replace it like in six months, right? So that was one of the major concerns which we uh, wanted to avoid uh, through ZS. Second, uh, second issue is the reliability, right? Um, there is always, a, because we, we the compute machines are base machines uh, and the reliability, and they have like limited storage, so there is always a noisy neighbor issue, right? Application or multiple application and writing a lot of data which can fill up the disks and that can cause uh, problems into other application, as well as the same application, which is writing so much data. There are other issues like machine goes down, disk failures, uh, and then pretty much there are use cases which write so much shuffle data, which cannot come or which cannot reside into one machine. Those use cases, you know, cannot be enabled uh, running here. There is another concern about Kubernetes, um, dynamic allocation. Um, so, uh, because Kubernetes does not have a remote, we cannot do dynamic allocation on Kubernetes. So, we probably need to write something external to be enabled to go to Kubernetes. And the other uh, main concern was the co-location. So, um, in Uber, uh, we are very much efficiency-driven uh, uh, company. So, what we do is we wanted to enable our batch and stateless processing together, and which can Actually, you can run stateless services with the batch services. However, our batch services writes so much data, uh, the stateless services get uh, impacted because of that on the same machine. So for them to uh, be run together, we need to run, we need to move the write part from the disk to somewhere external where the, both the processing can happen together. So these are the main of the, some of the concerns which we wanted to um, uh, highlight and because of that these challenges we actually started the project called ZS. Um, so before we actually could be started we experimented with different approaches in order to solve these challenges which we mentioned earlier. The main and foremost point was to reduce the local rights however that seems not possible as we wanted to increase our workloads. Rather removing it so the other way we wanted is remove writes from the local and write somewhere else, right? We did a lot of experiments in order to come up with the correct design for ZS. First, we abstracted our shuffle manager with the external storage, um, such as NFS or HDFS. However, our performance benchmarking shown that NFS was 
twice x the slower and the HD plus was 5x slower. Though we were writing synchronous writes because um, HDFS is not supporting asynchronous writes, so that was uh, other than what we did is we actually um, we, re we we really pretty much experimented with semi asynchronous write uh, using multiple threads. As we know, HDFS does not support asynchronous writes. So we have to go with a um, semi asynchronous approach. So we had like different threads which we're writing, etc., to different files, and then even though that experiment also didn't go well, it was the even doing all this, we had like four x lower performance. Right. So then, what the other approach we took is we wrote a very um, lightweight streaming server, and we started streaming writes directly to HDFS. Uh, for the first experiment, and that was like 1.5 times slower. Um, and then what we tried is we directly stream those writes to the local instead of HDFS. However, that also had the slow performance because there's a lot of skills, et cetera. So that is not, uh, that was also not having the same performance as we get the external shipping service. So um, then what we did is we kind of went to the blackboard and then we said, okay, what we need to do. So we actually thought, okay, streaming writes to the local storage is the most prominent, better performance we got. So we wanted to improve it further. So what we did is uh, we pretty much change the MapReduce paradigm. Uh, and um, what it means change is we actually reversed it. Uh, as we saw in the previous slides, in MapReduce framework, mappers write data to local and reducers go to each mapper and fetch the data. What we did is we made all mappers for the same partition to go to the same remote server for mapper output. And our RSS server wrote their data sequentially onto a files. And in the reducer side, reducer will go, the, the partition it is assigned to, it will go to the same server and fetch that file or multiple files sequentially, right? Uh, what it means is mappers are multiple mappers are writing to the same machine, is going to the same one machine and getting all the data. That helped us a lot. Uh, because that helped us in two ways. One is the latencies got improved a lot. Second, because of your writing on SSD sequential writes, it helped improving the DWPD of the disk, which we are using. Right. So that that two that these are the two things which helped us a lot. Um, our uh, other optimizations are we are directly streaming to the shuffle server to the disk, and there is no uh, uh, temporary spill files in this executor side. We are avoiding that. So these are the things which actually improved the performance a bit uh, a lot. Actually. We have, as you see in the earlier slide, we have multiple hosts, which are executors running mapper task, and then there are multiple hosts, which is running reducer task. The shuffle manager is being abstracted out to write shuffle output to the remote shuffle service. And we have like a, a zookeeper, which can actually let you know which, which partition or which server you need to choose. Uh, I think Bo is going to talk about it in detail a little bit. Uh, so what in Overall level here, a mapper task will use Shuffle Manager to choose one server, and then all the same partition will return to that remote Shuffle server. Uh, those partition is written to the local disk, and as I said earlier, the host which is running reducer will go to one machine and fetch that partition, right? And this actually uh, helped us improving our performance, similar to the external uh, Shuffle service. Uh, though we are writing remote, right? And uh, so that's where we uh, overall architecture mm -hmm. for this year. Um, uh, now our colleague Bo will talk about uh, in detail uh, different aspects of uh, ZS. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you, Miyako, for the go through the all these details. And uh, yeah, we will do some deep dive for how we design this system. Yeah, by the way, so my name is Bo. So I work in Spark team in, in Uber. 
Uh, there will be a lot of details uh, from now, and uh, you guys have questions, so we can discuss questions as well. So I see some quick questions. Uh, <clears throat> okay, let me go through some quick stuff, then we can talk about the questions. In our design, we have some principles we want to follow. The first is we want to scale out uh, horizontally. So there's no uh, single server bottleneck, and we can just scale out uh, by adding more machines. Then different applications can use different shuffle server. This can just scale horizontally. And uh, for network, because we write and read the data to remote server, normally it's kind of slow than write to local disk. Uh, but we do a lot of problems tuning. So one thing we uh, pay very specific attention is uh, in network, the bandwidth these days is pretty fast. The bandwidth is kind of close to the local disk. But the latency is high comparing to local disk. So we try to avoid the uh, network latency as much as possible. Also, we do a lot of performance optimization, and uh, we we will talk about that in details. So next slide. Uh, Miyak, uh, next slide. Hey, Miyak. Okay, cool. Yeah, this is the overall. Act okay. So how? Uh, so. Okay. That. You want all this previous? Thing. Yeah, just just the next slide. Uh, okay. Oh, well, let me let me try to share my screen. How about that? Sure. Okay. Okay. So. Okay, so thank you guys uh, for the question. Sorry for for the interruption. We can't yeah, see your screen, Bo. Oh, you cannot see my screen? Uh, okay. We still can't see. Oh, we still can see me? Okay, let me do it. Okay, sorry. Uh, so let's do this. Is it this? This is this. This is the slide you want to go? Yeah. Yes. Or this one. Next one. This one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah, so this uh, illustrates how we distribute the shuffle data to different uh, shuffle server. Uh, here we have example, we have four mapper tasks and uh, we have three shuffle server and uh, we have five partition, which is five reducer. So for each mapper task, it connects to all the shuffle servers. Then it sends a record to different shuffle server based on the partition ID. For example, in the uh, if it is the first partition, it will go to the first server. If it is the second partition, it will go to second partition. If it go to second server, if the third partition, it will go to uh, second server. Yep. And uh, in the end, uh, for each shuffle server, all the data belonging to the same partition will go to the same server. So basically, this server kind of divide the, the data by partition. And for reducer side, each reducer just connect to uh, the corresponding server and download the partition file directly. So the reducer is pretty simple. It, the connection is one connection to each server. 
the map side, it has more network connections. So next slide. Yeah, so this kind of some calculation in general, let's say if we have map are reduced for servers. So for map side, the, the number of connection is M multiple S, it's a lot. So that part, we optimize that uh, specifically. For reducer side, reducer is, is simple. Yeah. Next slide. Go ahead, next slide. Yeah, we mentioned just now, we deal with the network latency very carefully. Uh, overall, we use NETI, it's a very high performance asynchronous server framework. And uh, we use different thread groups for different purposes. So one thread group for the socket uh, connect part, another is for processing and reading socket data. So they do not block each other. And we encoding the shuffle data by ourselves, use some binary protocol, try to make it compact uh, as much as possible. Yeah. So next one. For when we write to disk file, yeah, as uh, Miyako mentioned, uh, we write directly. And for the reducer read file, we use zero copy. So data is transferred uh, from the server side within the kernel and to the client side directly. Uh, I, I think previous slide also mentioned uh, we do compression from client side. We see the compression ratio is normally Sometimes it's a turn X, so the compression saves network bandwidth a lot. Yeah. So next slide. Oh yeah, we mentioned the compression. So next slide. Yeah, I try to be quick. I want to leave more time for the Q and A, so I will be uh, quick for some slides. Yeah, this is one technique we use. We find the serialization takes a lot of time for some applications. So we do serialization and the socket the network IO into thread so they can have in parallel. This can speed up the shuffle writing part. Next slide. Yeah, we use connection pool to try to reduce the connect operations. The connection. So next slide. Also for shuffle data commit, uh, we use asynchronous commit. Let's say we have 10 map tasks. So each map task can finish sending data to the server side. So normally we don't wait from the server to respond, says, okay, all the data is received and written to disk. If we wait that each map task will have some delay. So the optimization here is uh, each map task just keep sending data there and uh, it will send a marker, tell the server, okay, it's finished, the data. Then the task will be marked finished. After that, the next uh, map task could run. So this improved the uh, map task throughput overall. Yeah. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Yeah, for tolerance, uh, we use Zookeeper to register all the server. If some server is down, it will be gone from Zookeeper, so you can find out. So next slide. Also, it's about replica. We can write data to two server in parallel. So if one server is down it can still write to another server. It's just very common techniques. So next one. Yeah, we handle the state uh, flush uh, in some way to improve performance. So, so we're batching the state together and the write uh, to the disk to avoid for writing data, state data for each task. The next one. Go ahead, next one. So we have been running this in production for a while. So when you run this, uh, 
it hook up with uh, Spark Shuffle Manager API, so we can set uh, the class name to our Shuffle Manager name. Also, we because Spark itself doesn't provide very good support for this kind of remote shuffle scenario, so we kind of leverage uh, some information in map status to transfer some metadata information between our shuffle server and the Spark driver. We try to make it compatible with open source Spark, so people don't need to make any change to their uh, Spark internal code. They just need to add some config. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah, we've been running this for eight months, and we just open sourced it yesterday. If you go to GitHub Remote Travel Service, so you can find it. So next one. Yeah, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, for example, better multi-tenancy support. We should add quota for for big users, and uh, load and balancing, and uh, integrate uh, with the new Spark Shuffle Metadata API. So the community is working on some new metadata API, so which can support the remote shuffle scenario better. We can utilize that API. Next one. Yeah, I think that's all. So thank you guys. We're still hiring, and you can check our open source GitHub. I'm going to look at the questions. OK. The first question from Joseph, how does fetching from a single place helps in preventing spill files on reducer? Spill files on reducer? Uh, I'm not sure what kind of spill file on reducer. Do you mean the aggregation and the sorting? If you mean that, yeah, we still have that spill on reducers. OK, yeah, the sorting, yes. If you uh, currently, we still the reducer still fetch the data and uh, do the sorting on the reducer side. So the yeah, reason so is the, <coughs> sorry, go ahead. Okay, so the reason is uh, for sorting Spark, it's application logic. If you write Spark job, then say you have your own Java object, and uh, the sorting is very specific to your own code. That logic. Uh, is not transferred to remote shuffle server. It is only in Spark application side. So the shuffle server cannot do sorting. That's why we do this implementation. But uh, we do have some sort to support some kind of sorting in the server side. For example, if you use Spark SQL, uh, it's uh, dead frame, dead structure. That dead structure is kind of uh, well known and uh, it's not in most cases, it's not application related. Uh, if we know some metadata inside it, in that case, we can do sorting in the server side. Yeah, that could be some future work we could do. Yeah, yeah but for you are right. From reducer side, we don't we don't have a way to remove this fix. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next question is: It easy to plug Zeus to TensorFlow? Uh, I think it depends. So Zeus has two parts. One part is only have Java code, which is which does not depend on Spark. It it is a standalone shuffle server and a standalone shuffle client. It has nothing to do with Spark. If TensorFlow need to shuffle data, I think it's possible to reuse that part. But uh, I'm not sure mm -hmm. about the TensorFlow API. So if TensorFlow allow you plug in your own kind of shuffle implementation, you may need to add a adapter layer on top of our Java code. And in Zeus, there's another part, Scala code. So that implement a Spark a Shuffle Magic API. So that is tied with Spark itself. It is not reusable by other framework. So, but if you run TensorFlow inside the Spark, then uh, it's easy when everything is still spark, so it can use Zeus naturally. It depends on different scenarios. Yeah. yeah, so from natively, we only support right now the spark. We haven't, don't have integration with TensorFlow yet. But as a, as both said, right, we can make it work with uh, other frameworks if they have a requirement for shuffle. Yeah. Cool. So any other question? Yeah.
Okay, so if no question, yeah, we can wait maybe a few minutes here. I think so, yeah, feel free to ask any questions, yeah. or you can reach us uh, through email or through our website. Yeah, this is our email addresses mentioned here, and these are the GitHub uh, link for us, uh, for the remote shuffle service. Please, uh, we welcome community support as well as contribution. So please go ahead, look at it, and let give us feedback, and we can work together on this. And definitely, we are hiring. <laughs> OK. All right. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Bye-bye.